Hi there, everybody. I'm Rafi Neiman, and uh, we're in the uh, Osteotomy Weekly AO course. This is the fourth installment of the femoral diaphysis module. Uh, so in weeks five and six here, uh, we have explored many concepts of deformity analysis and correction. Uh, today is an Ask the Expert session where the participants will uh, be sending us questions. We'll be discussing cases that are um, that are not the ones from our discussion group. But before we do all that, I'm going to review what we had on Saturday. So just an overall recap of this whole femoral diaphysis session. Uh, two weeks ago on Saturday, we had some lectures on uh, various aspects of uh, femoral diaphysis. We had angular deformity, rotational deformity. Uh, we had length deformity, and then a complex deformity correction with the clamshell. Then we did a review of that, then cases last week uh, in a smaller discussion group session. Uh, today, we're gonna go over uh, some of those cases quickly. To, so for those of you who didn't get to see all of the cases, these are the faculty that, for the course. Um, uh, these were the cases that we went over last week on Saturday, uh, these four cases, and I'm gonna go over them briefly here so that you have a chance to see uh, what maybe you missed in your discussion group or that somebody else talked about. The first one was a femoral, non, uh, femoral malunion case where a patient had an acute hip fracture. Their intertrochanteric fracture was acute, but they had a chronic varus malunion and they were contemplating knee replacement at the time. Uh, they ended up getting a 15 degree uh, closing wedge osteotomy and treatment of their intertrochanteric acute fracture with a single device. Um, we discussed all the options that were available for correcting angular deformity with open and closing wedges, single cut mathematically derived osteotomies, clamshell osteotomies. And then uh, we also discussed a lot of the options that uh, would be available besides a blade plate for implants. Um, these really require a lot of planning uh, and really perfect execution on the closing wedge or else you're gonna end up with a secondary deformity. Um, the second case was an interesting case of uh, osteomyelitis with fracture. The patient presented with a fracture and a massive abscess in the middle of his thigh. Uh, he had uh, multiple debridements with uh, initial antibiotic loaded spacers. And then eventually, once the infection was uh, deemed to be under control, uh, really nice uh, monolateral or monorail transport, which was from distal to proximal. And over the ensuing months, uh, was able to regenerate all the bone necessary to make up their large uh, segmental defect of their femur. Um, this generated a lot of discussion as well. Uh, rail transports are very versatile uh, and they're available all over the world. Uh, unlike some of the uh, uh, motorized nails, uh, the problems with nails in this kind of case are um, the presence of infection and they're very high cost. Um, and you can get rails and you can get other external fixation devices to do this type of bone transport. Uh, there was a lot of discussion in the groups about other um, techniques such as induced membrane technique or even structural cages. Um, and uh, this case also illustrated that there are a lot of pitfalls that can occur with these type of transport procedures. And one of them is early consolidation, which occurred in this case and, they, and how it was remedied. The third case was one of femoral malunion. Uh, this is a case of a patient who had bilateral femur fractures. Uh, the left one had an apex anterior uh, and also a coronal plane, mild deformity in the coronal plane, but uh, major deformities in the rotational plane on both sides. And so really the trick here was understanding what do you correct it to? The right side was, uh, had excessive antitorsion, left side had excessive retrotorsion, uh, and the, the surgeon uh, decided to do a distal uh, clamshell osteotomy through that deformity and correct the rotation. Uh, this is really a high level uh, clamshell osteotomy treatment. The metaphyseal nature of it makes it difficult for, um, for nails to be stable. So you really have to be very good at your metaphyseal and nailing before you try a clamshell like this. This should not be your first clamshell. Um, and when you're doing torsional correction, you can't just uh, rely on one or the other of clinical or um, uh, measurements, you have to, uh, to use both clinical and radiographic assessments really to figure out uh, what's right for your patient. Now, the fourth case was uh, a uh, deformity case where uh, the patient had varus and shortening on the right lower extremity. Uh, and this was really an exercise of 
uh, and execution of uh, master level planning. Um, this case, uh, with its uh, uh, calculation of the uh, proximal tibial angle, uh, and then using that, uh, the anatomic axis compared to the um, mechanical axis gave the surgeon the uh, trajectory for how to uh, redirect a nail from dis uh, retrograde in order to correct the deformity and then gain length. And some of the discussion is, how do you know uh, where your length is going to end up? Uh, is that going to give you a misalignment, a translation? Uh, and, the, and it makes the planning very... Um, very challenging. So it was executed beautifully uh, with, uh, with his uh, planning. Uh, during your discussions, or maybe after your discussions, you may have discovered there's, um, there are other methods for planning. Um, this is called the reverse planning method, and uh, you can find this uh, article online. Uh, this describes the process of going in reverse. Uh, you saw that to a large degree in the first couple of weeks. In fact, uh, the first week or two, uh, Raul Vedia showed you his methods for reverse planning. It's slightly different than this, but when you're lengthening, uh, you have to uh, account for length because as it's lengthening, it's going to change your mechanical axis. So uh, this is a really nice method. I actually just went ahead and replanned the same case, uh, and here's where I've replanned it. Uh, yeah, uh, I take mean, the I reverse like side just to understand what their really proximal tibial angle is. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, well, the doesn't matter, you can I'm not find their hip center, uh, make the tibia vertical so that you can start uh, with that and extend that up proximally. Uh, here, you, I'm going to show you, you just match the, the tibia on the affected side to the, to the unaffected side. And from there, you can um, pick your osteotomy location. And then you move the center of the femoral head up to the center of the femoral head of where it's supposed to be. That'll give you your proper length and mechanical axis. Uh, and once you do that, then you can rotate uh, the nail in its lengthened state into the trajectory that you anticipate for the distal femur. Once you've done that, then you can then shorten the nail back to where it's supposed to go uh, or where it starts from, I should say. And that will give you your trajectory. So uh, the trajectory that I uh, came up with just happened to be uh, within a degree or so of the same uh, trajectory that, um, that the surgeon had come up with. Uh, so there's just two different methods. And what I would suggest is if, you, uh, if you're interested in these, both of these techniques, you should go back to YouTube or Zoom and look at these cases in detail. These are available to you online through uh, the uh, AO Trauma North America. They have a a playlist that will include all these previous weeks and you can review these cases uh, and see the different ways to plan them. So uh, this was a, an exercise of anatomic axis planning, which is different from mechanical axis planning uh, unless you do it in this reverse method. Uh, the surgeon used blocking screws and really the, the meticulous preoperative planning is the operation. The operation itself is not the, the hardest part. Uh, so those were the cases from, uh, from last week. Uh, Dr. Serkin, do we have any uh, participant questions yet? I don't see any as of now, so why don't we uh, remember everyone, if you want to ask a question, to please use the question and answer uh, tab. But I think you can move on to the cases, and I'll keep an eye on them for you. Yeah, so um, we, have a, we have a really broad range of faculty uh, for this course. Um, uh, Tim Weber, Mauricio Capuri. Mitchell Bernstein, uh, they're going to be with me today to discuss some cases, uh, and um, we're going to go ahead and, and look at those. That's me, <laughs> if you can't see me. Um, just to remind uh, you that if you do uh, uh, log in, turn off your microphone, send in your questions to Q&A instead of chat, because then they're archived. We can go back and, uh, and look at these questions later and answer them in a subsequent session if we need to. So this first case is a case of uh, a femoral malunion. And uh, this is a 26-year-old woman who had a femur fracture as a child. And at that time, she was treated non-operatively. Uh, she's now an adult, and she comes in um, and presents with, the, uh, with this set of images and uh, leg length inequality as well. So what... Um, I guess, Tim, I'll ask you, what, uh, what other uh, images do you think you would need uh, 
just to get started on evaluating her uh, deformity. Yeah, so um, for sure, standing alignment view uh, yeah. to go ahead and try to uh, get a better feel for her overall alignment. Uh, we can obviously see the deformity here, but it'll help us with leg length discrepancies. Yeah, really, that's, uh, I agree. Um, and Mauricio, you did spend quite a bit of time with us in the first couple of weeks going over um, alternative methods of preoperative pl pre -operative planning methods. You and Mitch Bernstein both spent quite a bit of time on uh, deformity and rotational analysis. So um, is this sufficient for you, uh, Mauricio, to, to start um, understanding this deformity? Mauricio, are you there? Um, do you, Mauricio, uh, do you have what you need here to do? Do yeah, you have what now, you need here to do the analysis? No, I would like to add two more image studies for this case. One would be the long standing x ray in a lateral projection mm -hmm. to evaluate better the lateral uh, the projection, the deformity in the sagittal pane. And also, I would like to have a CT scan to evaluate torsion. Okay, so you want a torsional analysis through CT overlay the, what, what parts? So normally what we do for the CT, we like to get skin cut, uh, CT skin cuts from the hip, knee and ankle. For the hip, we normally merge two images, the center of the femoral head and the greater truncate there. For the knee, we need the axis of the epicondyle and also the upper proximal tibia. And for the ankle, we need the axis of the ankle, including the, um, the talus and the, and the line of the syndesmosis. I, yeah, I agree. I, I suspect that uh, the surgeon had a, a sagittal plane alignment film, uh, though I'm not certain. Um, but do you have uh, some of what you need on this uh, lateral x-ray here, or is this not enough for you for sagittal plane deformity analysis? I would say it helps a lot um, yeah. to have a long uh, femur x-ray in the way you present it to us. Uh, but uh, I would like to see the long-standing x-ray as well. So it gives me a better picture of what happens when the patient bears weight. Yeah. So, um, Tim, you see, you don't need to go, you may not even be able to see those numbers from where you are, um, but overall, what's your assessment of the, like the overall problems of this radiographically? I'll help you out if you're having... Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, valgus deformity, uh, uh, relatively mid-shaft femur, um, and uh, it's short by centimeter say 27, Yeah, probably two centimeters. There's yep. a three centimeter block underneath and the pelvis is relatively level. Yeah. So she's got a valgus femur, leg length inequality. Mitch? What else do we need to know? Uh, well, the physical exam, I think, is very important, how they present. Uh, it's a very juicy malunion by the x-rays, which you may have before you see the patient. And I think uh, exactly. it, it, it's very important you know, to, to see the patient uh, disrobed in shorts and actually look at, look at the way they walk or listen to what they say is the issue. Um, cause it may, it may or may not be the, the limb like discrepancy. That's the issue. Cause you know, let's say a three centimeter LLD is not really symptomatic most of the time. So, um, we fortunately have some images that show some, um, some differences, I guess you would say in their overall rotation. So when they're prone like this, what are we seeing? This is her right side which is affected correct it's the right side now she's prone so what do we see here 
So, um, so again, you got to just take a look at the right and then the left because it could be, you know, confusing looking at all three. Exactly. Um, so here's the left. Gotta yeah, so that's the left, and that would be the external rotation. Exactly. Yeah, because even that's though the foot's pointing rotation in, on the left. Yeah. External rotation on the right. So there's a, and then a the lot, the a lot of and, and right, right. So, so with with one hand on on her pelvis or on her uh, lower back, you can see as you internally rotate, you see when you start engaging the pelvis. And this patient looks like maybe just after zero or five degrees of internal, she starts moving her uh, her pelvis. So she may have zero internal or minus five of it uh, yeah. of internal. So this isn't just you standing there asking her to move, you actually have to have your hand on the, the low pelvis and- Yeah, and this is obviously, this is me taking a picture for a course, but, but when, I, when, you, when I examine her, I mean, I was taught this from uh, you know, pediatric orthopods. Um, when you examine her, you, have, uh, you make sure they're relaxed and you have a hand on their, on their lower back. Yeah. So she has a, a real rotational problem. Now that is um, really her main complaint. It's not just her. I mean, she doesn't really know whether she's varus or valgus. She knows she's short and she's, but she's really got a rotational problem. So now that we have this list um, and, you know, sometimes the patient is just not really you know some they they have to prioritize their list for you it's not for you to prioritize for them right so she doesn't want her leg lengths equalized if it's going to be some uh significantly increased complexity to her surgery she wants an easy surgery weight bearing is tolerated you know this is in an age where patients have jobs and kids and they may not have time to take that much time off so so that that was actually it with, with her she you know, I, I got very excited with, with getting all the deformity components, but um, she's a single mom. She's, she's, uh, she's my patient. So she's from Northern Quebec, which uh, is, is like a couple hour plane ride. It's a very rural area and, and she has to go back up north. She's not interested in coming back every two weeks to assess her regenerative. That doesn't interest yeah. her. So. Right. She's like, I just want this rotation fixed and I got to go back to my family and I got to work. Yeah. Which was very educational for me to, you know, to, again, listening to the patients on what, what the priority is for them. Like you said, it's a juicy malunion and everybody wants to be a hero and correct everything on this. But, um, but sometimes that's yeah. not in their best interest. So, uh, Mauricio, what, um, What's your, what was your, what's your, the first thing that popped into your head when you saw this, this uh, constellation of deformity and clinical finding? What, what did you think first that you would want to do for her? So as has been pointed out, when you see a case like this one, you want to correct and fix everything you can. Uh, but as Mitch pointed out and very well, you have to listen to the patient. So most likely now uh, we have to focus in the torsional deformity plus the valgus alignment that she has. Yeah. And most likely by addressing this too, even if you don't care much about leg length discrepancy, uh, you may address the patient's needs. So what would you do? What would your, what, just give me one idea for how you would do the correction. What type of correction would you do? So uh, basically uh, for this particular one, um, uh, in my, in my uh, practice, I see two options. One option would be uh, to go with the clamshell uh, correction, intramedullary nail fixation. The other option would be a single cut, um, uh, mathematically calculated um, correction. These are the two things that come to my mind. How do you, yeah. I have a problem with assessing um, or how do you prioritize the rotational deformity without uh, worsening the coronal malalignment, i.e. the valgus, or how do you, can, can you do both at the same time if you correct 40 degrees of rotation? Yeah, it's complicated. You're right, it's complicated. 
I would say for those complex deformities, um, if you consider using the clamshell technique, maybe this is what makes it easier for deformities like this one. I don't know um, if this exactly addresses your question, but with the clamshell, most likely creating a segment, intermediate segment, um, that gives you freedom to correct both torsion and correct uh, deformity, it normally addresses the problem. Do you have a different uh, uh, thought about that? I mean, in my in in my wheelhouse, what what I would do if I'm doing a nail, I would just make sure it starts and ends along the anatomic axis. I mean, is is it more complicated than that, or or I mean, that's the no. way I see it. No, but it depends on you've got. It's not a coronal or a sagittal plane deformity. It's in a different plane, right? It's a primarily other plane deformity. We didn't talk about how you would. Um, find that plane, but it's not thinking about rotation for a minute, but just um, what is the maximum plane of deformity and where would your correction be? That's the max deformity. And you can correct that with a nail, assuming that you can, you, you know, that it's, it's not blocked. It's not a, it's a, not such a big uh, deformity here. There was some offset. Let's, there was some offset on the x-ray, Tim. Tim, how would you yeah. feel about nailing that? Just, how would you do that? Outside of a clamshell? Yeah, well, with or without a clamshell, right? That Mitch was saying, if you align the proximal anatomic axis and the distal anatomic axis, you're gonna get realignment. And I 100% I, I agree with that. It's just a matter of how do you do it? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um... Nowadays, the knee-jerk reaction probably is is a clamshell here, yeah. but I don't think that, I mean, uh, prior to us understanding the clamshell or knowing about the clamshell, um, uh, we would have made our, uh, made our cut and then uh, reconstituted the two canals. A um, couple different ways to do that, you know, either uh, drill bit uh, through the through the osteotomy site, um, or uh, the Charnley alls uh, to go ahead and, and open the canals. Once the canals are are back open again, then it's a matter of of threading your ball tip guide rod, which is you know the the osteotomy is open, and so yeah. should be able to do that. Um, I, I think so, that I think the fact that she doesn't want the length restored is really a blessing. <laughs> okay, it, I, I agree, but easier. And, and uh, so when I saw this, I got, uh, as, as Mitch said, I got kind of, I got excited about it. And I thought, well, you know, maybe we, we don't need to get all her length back, but can we get some of her length back with, um, with doing this? How can we get some of her length back? Mauricio, just correcting it, is that going to give her some of her length back? Well, normally when you do the uh, single cut osteotomy and you rotate those fragments together and you try to bring them back to the normal torsion, sometimes you end up getting some length back. Right. Just by it's getting two sides of a triangle. The, yeah. Because once you have the torsion restored uh, with the single cut, as long as you do it correctly, you're going to get some length back. Well, I was I was salivating over some sort of a uh, anti-grade, retrograde, all internal saw over here to cut transversely over here, somehow to cut over here, um, and then gain some of her length back by doing two cuts in two planes. But um, but then you start thinking, well, what if I get greedy and I can't get that all that length back, and then I start then you then it turns into a lot harder of an operation than if you respect her wish of saying she doesn't want to have her length really restored. But I think not only, it, respect, her, not only respect her wishes, but, but then, you know, like her, her main priority or what she complained most about was rotation. And so yeah. prioritizing, you know, our rotation correction first. And then mm -hmm. after that, uh, you know, if you can devise a plan to go ahead and still gain some, some length, fine, but. 
One of the advantages I see of a clamshell is that you have two transverse osteotomies around which to rotate. So, you know, some of your rotation is going through each. And the longer the distance between the clam, the more space there is between it to absorb that rotation. So Mitch, you had asked something about the maximum amount you could correct. And I think maybe nobody knows the answer to that, but the more distance between them, the more ability you have to correct that, uh, all of them. So we talked about all those plans. Um, let's see, uh, let's see how this went. So, hey, um, yes. Um, Raphael, uh, yes. what do you guys think about doing a dome osteotomy? Well, I'm the, I'm the lover, the biggest lover of domes. Um, a dome, you're probably talking about a focal dome, um, which would be uh, in, a, in the plane of maximum deformity. That's somewhere between the coronal and sagittal planes, right? So um, with it being valgus and apex anterior, I think that it's not very accessible because you have to be cutting through the quads from front to back, sort of, but off plane somewhere, right? So you're in between uh, directly anterior and then somewhere between there and I'd have to just calculate it um, one side or the other. You're either going from medial or from lateral in order to get the maximum deformity correction. And that's just, um, you know, soft tissue wise, it's just not a val uh, viable place unless you do a, a true dome and a true dome is different from a focal dome. A true dome is where you have a concave and a convex reamer. So you cut both ends, then you, um, then you put a reamer on each side. I, I have an example of that later in this talk, but um, that would correct all your planes, rotation and angulation, uh, but you'll sacrifice length when you do that. So it's a great idea and I love the dome whenever I can because it's compressible. You're not leaving it open like a, any kind of a opening wedge. But because rotation is the most important part of this, um, we still have to make that the priority. So any other questions, Mike? Sir, sir Um Yeah, there was one other, which is, do you routinely use in, intraoperative EMG if you're going to significantly lengthen the leg or the limb? And if so, what is that number? Wow, does anybody um, <laughs> feel like answering that? I'll answer it if nobody does, but. <laughs> I have no, I do not have experience with EMGs. I think, you know, preoperatively, if it's a very large angular correction, um, and I'm doing it acutely. So if it's a very large angular correction, I tend not to do it acutely, but if I'm doing it acutely, especially in, in pediatrics where there's these massive deformities, we usually resect a segment of bone to, to make it somewhat isometric, the, the length. That's, that's sort of my strategy. Yeah. I would say, um, does anybody else have a comment? I don't have any experience with using EMGs, but you know, unless there's um, some significant scarring where you've got a, a contracture or something like that, um, I think returning them back to their normal length, usually you're gonna get away with that, especially yeah. in the femur. So the one thing, um, th and this patient actually has some of it, and that is the combination of valgus and apex anterior will put, when you correct that, you're gonna put more stretch on the sciatic nerve, um, especially the apex anterior part of it. Um, and so the more correction there is in that apex anterior deformity, the more stretch you're gonna have. And if you try to correct length with the same, um, then, um, then you're gonna be more at risk. Now, I don't use EMG routinely for this. When I do acute lengthenings, uh, and it's been a really a while now because we have some other really nice options for lengthening. But when I would do acute lengthenings, I would get an EMG and then I would stretch them out and see if there were any changes. So as far as what threshold number, I can't give you any numbers. I rely on my EMG techs intraoperatively to, do, to tell me when there's changes in the signal. I think Tim's comment about in the femur is very important because I would I, I personally would not do any of these large malunion corrections in the tibia acutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is really true. That's a good point, Tim. Um, but still you, you don't want to over you don't want to stretch the, the sciatic. So you really need to pay attention to what direction your femur is. But most of the femur you're right will will accept a, a correction. 
I like the concept though of if you're if you're moving the bone towards the nerve or away from the nerve is a yeah. good thought. Yeah. So um so we've got uh, a reference pin in the lesser trochanter, so it's out of the way of any sort of intramedullary um, instrumentation. Now, um, this ends up being uh, exactly what Mitch was talking about, um, putting it down the anatomic axis in the proximal segment. This is really, um, in concept, it's very similar to what you would do with a clamshell, but it's just a single osteotomy. I mean, just this is the part that uh, I love because um, he gets the the proximal end uh, reamed up, then he, he completes his osteotomy, and then redirects that that all into the correct position in the distal segment, and just sort of lets those two find their their original home. But all the while keeping rotation in mind, right? They get to get these reference wires. Uh, and Raul Vede made a great point of telling us to make sure you have more than one because if you turn on one, if you use one to rotate, especially with large corrections, and that gets loose, then you, you don't have your reference anymore. So you should have two yeah, wires. Those, those I used, that, so I, I did this percutaneously. Those I used as joysticks to, mm -hmm. uh, but, but when you're operating, I think it's very important, like you said, not to, not to touch your rotational markers. Yeah. I was, I think it was with Maurizio. I was at a course, an AO course, and we had these German surgeons, and they showed a picture of them with a sticker that said, "Do not touch on, on their rotational <laughs> happen. Yes. And I, I tell my residents, I, "Amazing, amazing. Do not touch yeah. the rotational markers." Yeah, we should tie something on the end of them, or put aisle band or something, so you can't put a um, T handle chuck on them or something. So yeah, so that's that. So these these ones right here by the osteotomy, these are what? These are the ones you're using to turn? No, those are joysticks. Those are threaded uh, two eight K wires. Oh, just to pull, to push and pull. So just to push and pull to try yeah. to make it easier. Okay. Right. So um, and then really, the the nail gets or the the femur gets pretty capacious down here. It's pretty big. So if you don't tell it where to go, it's going to go where it wants to go. And there, there's a lot, there is a lot of stress on this thing. Like yeah. as you rotate that amount of deformity, the nail, the, the nail just wants to slide down that medial cortex, which makes me nauseous a little bit. So I had to, you know, I have to now do the rotational correction and ensure that the nail doesn't end up in the medial femoral condyle, basically. Right. And do you do, you're making sure, um, when are you doing your rotational correction? Are you doing it when the nail is down already or before the nail is down? Um, usually before the nail is down to a, to a certain degree. Um, otherwise I find it, you know, it, it almost becomes like a three point bend when the nail yeah. is down. And, and even though you're quote rotating around the nail, there's so many subtle curves that it, uh, it becomes very difficult. Yeah, uh, that's, um, I think. I mean, you um, can see, you can see the distal half in the middle picture. It's going, only going halfway through the femur. That's because it's, it's aiming so oblique relative yeah. to the proximal half pin that it, it, it just shoots out very quickly. because There's such a large deformity. Yeah. So, you know, you have to, uh, you have to think about the bend in the nail too. So that's why I asked that question about the rotation. You want to try to do as much of your rotation before you put the nail down. Keith Mayo made that point because he had one of his cases in the first discussion group a few weeks ago where he needed to change the trajectory of the nail and you need to make sure that you account for the bend in the nail when you're, when you're changing your rotation. <clears throat> Mitch, I have a question for you and this could be something nice for everybody watching. Uh, one of the three keys tricks here would be how to secure your rotation before you lock your nail. Because this is, could be an issue um, when you're going to lock your nail. Some people, they don't pay attention that what you have to really move is the C-arm and not the leg of the patient. So you have to make sure that you airplane the bed. You have to make sure that you, you, you turn your C-arm around the patient and not in the other way around. 
Otherwise, all your efforts to get the rotation right are going to be lost. Any, what any else can you do? Uh, so this patient had an X fix as well to, yeah. to, hold, to exactly. hold this thing. Um, the other thing I do when I do rotational corrections, I lock distally first so that the inner lock and the proximal segment are off the handle and I, I, um, I don't need really the perfect circles. And, and you're absolutely right with the C-arm and the X-ray. The newer machines can, hyper, can go hyperlateral. So if you have one of those newer C-arms that can go beyond lateral, it helps you also. Yeah, I believe the idea to have an X-fix is a critical one because it's so easy to lose torsion in those cases and to have an X-fix holding the fragments together once you get where you want to be, it makes easier and safer before you lock the nail. Yeah. And I absolutely love that, uh, uh, your comment about locking distally first. I've not heard that before and that makes a ton of sense. Uh, now you've got total control over that distal fragment. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really matter where the proximal locks are. It's brilliant. The only time that that um, is, uh, is a, a challenge is when you're using a reconstruction nail with screws going up into the neck. Sure. But, yes. Uh, for yes. 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 <laughs> that is it. Yes. Which does happen yes. with these, you know, if you're doing osteotomies, clamshells, you have short segments. A lot of times you do end up putting screws up in the neck. Uh, but for these, that's, yeah, that's a great point. So here's a rotation afterwards. Um, I think she got it. You got it right. And she looks um, really good. So, I mean, she's not standing on blocks. We don't exactly know what her length uh, is, but. I, I couldn't get her back for a, a standing hip to ankle because she, she returned once and uh, I mean, we all love deformity. That's why we're here. But these patients yeah. are like, yeah, they're so they're so happy. They're so happy. They feel better when they wake up. To be honest yeah. with you, it's like that. You know, when you do spine surgery for the right. I have had. Uh, I had a. Yeah, yeah. I can remember a patient who I did a femoral shortening on actually, and. She uh, was weight bearing as tolerated. And then the first morning after surgery, she was crying in the hallway when I went to go make rounds. And, I'm, and I asked, well, are you in a lot of pain? And she said, no, this is just the first time my back doesn't hurt and my legs feel like they're the same length. So she was crying with happiness, not with pain, which uh, they get, they're really happy if you can correct their, the, what, the, what they're looking for. So, so um, all right, we got a panel of three of you. Um, we have um, a few cases yet to go. Um, we have, a, uh, let me just pose them to you uh, and then you guys can pick one. We have um, one of a femoral uh, deformity or femoral um, segmental bone loss, one with pure rotational uh, or pure length actually, not rotation, that says rotation, pure length and then uh, length and rotation. So what do you guys wanna go through? You're leaving it up to the moderator. Sure. All right. Not, not rotation. Not rotation. All right. I picked it. Yeah. Yes. No, no, no. Actually, the other ones didn't have rotation. I, I wrote rotation, but they were both, there were two uh, leg lengths. All right. Here's a case from, um, uh, from Honduras, uh, Holy Family Surgery Center in near Tegucigalpa. This is a 37-year-old patient who uh, was in a motorcycle crash at least five years prior to presentation to this clinic with an open infected femur with bone loss and a prior open tibia fracture with an Aquinas foot. Uh, and this is how the patient presented to the clinic. Um, I'll just go through these quickly and then I'll start asking you guys some questions. Uh, obviously there's an open draining sinus in the femur, in the thigh, it's lots of incisions, skin grafting. Uh, this is what his that, that left foot looks like. That's what his tibia looks like. And uh, he had a, literally dozens of uh, debridements of that femur. Um, then eventually he came to this uh, clinic and he started getting a different type of treatment with um, debridement of the entire dead segment of bone in the central portion of his femur and then sequential 
exchanges of antibiotic loaded nails with spacers. So uh, that was to, to basically control his infection and get his soft tissues to heal. So this is the point where the, uh, I'm presenting the case to you as to uh, what, is, what is your list of priorities and problems here with this man? He's gone from this to now assume that this wound is healed. And he's got those, uh, those bony problems. And I'm not gonna, you're not going to be able to get a bunch of advanced imaging, I'll just tell you. What, what was his, I, I think I missed it, my internet was a little unstable. What's his diagnosis at the beginning? This is from... Uh... So five years ago, motorcycle crash, open femur, open tibia. Okay. And okay. Uh, sure. had a lot of debridements of his femur, had X fix, had nails, play, he just had a lot of different things. And uh, then he started getting antibiotic coated uh, nails with spacers and locked nails with spacers and locked nails with, you know, coating to get con infection control. So that's basically what these, uh, these images are showing. It's just a sequence of his uh, debridements. So where, 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 what, are we, what are we facing here? What are our problems? We've got- so on a, what's, what's the patient's expectations in this case? What's the patient looking for? He has a family and he hasn't worked in five years. So those are his expectations as he wants to be able to get back to work and help take care of his family. What about his knee? I can see what happens to the ankle. What about the knee function? So his knee function is very stiff. He's probably got about 45 to 60 degrees total motion of his, of his knee. And he cannot have a flat knee, right? I can see he has a flexion contractor as well. A little bit. Yes, he does. Mm -hmm. But you can see his um, soft tissues are healed, and to the best of their knowledge, they're unable to find any current infection in his thigh. He's never really had an infection in his tibia, actually. But he has a non-union there? Yes. Is the is distal tibia a non-union? Yes, he does, a distal tibial non-union. And his foot looks like that. Do we have any uh, comments from? So uh, someone is asking if there's any neurological def deficit. Um, he's got fixed contract. So this was uh, this is a question from a participant, and I'll just go ahead and answer it. Um, he has uh, he has no good function of his toes. He has some sensation, but it's sort of spotty. He has quadriceps and hamstring uh, control and function. So his he has control of his knee, but really not much of his foot. So, so this is, so the left, yeah, I was gonna, so the, the le that's the left femur, left knee, left tibia, left foot, left ankle. All of it's the right. Left. Oh, so all, all, everything's left. The right side is normal. Correct, everything's ipsilateral. Okay, okay. Sorry. So, so. I think the question that one of the participants asked is, is very important, as was the questions related to the soft tissue. I, I think the bone is, is important, but less of, a, of an issue. I prioritize neurologic deficit, contractures, arthritis in the joints, and, and then decide if we're doing a salvage versus some sort of amputation, mm -hmm. and then work, work the reconstruction that way. Like, are we, are we salvaging his ankle? That's the question. Are we salvaging his ankle? That's the question. Can he weight bear well, on, that, on that Aquinas foot? I mean, no. typically that, no. that foot right there is not going to be a functional foot. But, no. but given his limb length discrepancy, it almost makes him level uh, with the foot. So is he is he ambulating on that and how much pain does he have at his distal tibia um he's not ambulating on it so um he has pain but he's he's pretty he's a pretty tough stoic person and in terms of of lld or bone loss you said 15 centimeters of of yeah. acquired he's got at least all coming centimeters. from the 50 uh, from the 50 from the femur mostly coming from the femur at least uh, 12 is coming from the femur. 
It's a real doozy here, this one. So um, I mentioned where he came from only so that you can understand what the resources are generally available for patients in Central America, really all over the world in, in different places. They're, they're not the same as they are in North America where we are. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm just I'm thinking out loud, if I may, you know, uh, an amputation of the tibia would eliminate the ankle, you know, I would assume we would be looking at some sort of ankle fusion procedure, uh, and then you'd have to get his distal tibia to, to, to heal. So you can eliminate that. Uh, but then Mauricio's question about his knee range of motion is very important. Yeah. Um, well, we have some active uh, participants who are asking a few questions that I'm going to just add to the discussion because they're pertinent. One is, what was the baseline for mobilization and uh, baseline with this? He doesn't mobilize that on that leg. He doesn't weight bear. But one of our participants has suggested per, consider a uh, gradual correction of the soft tissue and bone of his ankle to try to get him up and then arthrodesis ankle and then transport um, for his tibial and femoral defects and then amputate if everything else fails. I think that's a very logical um, that that that's very that's very good plan, and then it goes back to Mauricio's question at the beginning, which is what what does the patient want? Because you get yes. excited with that project, which yes. we would all love to do, and then the guy's like, "What do you?" <laughs> right. Look at the number of scars on his leg. He's been doing this for almost five years, or about five years. So, um, I don't think he wants another two or three years of maybe. I'm not saying that uh, uh, trying to correct that Aquinas uh, isn't possible, but uh, given the non-union above it, I mean, the non-union is there because the ankle's so stiff. Um, the non-union's trying to create the ankle joint. And so getting that, getting that ankle into a plantigrade position uh, is gonna be awfully tough uh, given the non-union above it. Um, would anybody talk about amputation with this man? Yes. Primarily? Yes. Yeah, Mauricio. Yes, I would. Uh, I would say uh, uh, this is a kind of patient that you're going to spend a lot of time listening to the patient, trying to understand the expectations, also yeah. trying to understand how many years he has been dealt with this problem. It has been a long journey for, for this gentleman. Yeah. And sometimes if the patient wants to come back to work and wants to have a time frame uh, what Mitch just said makes um, easier and faster in terms of thinking about getting a prosthesis and being able to walk again, try to get his leg length um, compensated by some extent. And this would be very beneficial as part yeah. of the, and this is not going to fix the entire problem because you still have the femur to deal with. Right. And you still don't know exactly how functional this knee is going to be because I'm sure the quadriceps is very much adhered to the femur at this yeah. point. Um, we had a we just had a, uh, a comment by uh, Ashish Anand who I had in one of my discussion groups, um, and uh, he's suggesting a below the knee amputation, get the femur to heal, and then a quadriceps plasty, which um, is an extremely logical. It's a very logical sequence of. Like, um, and I would ask, I'm going to ask Ashish just sort of as an open question, and I want the panel to answer it. Why is a BK uh, preferred? Uh, and the panelists can answer that question for him. Well, well it, eliminates, it eliminates the, the need of trying to get the tibia healed. Um, it gets rid of uh, what sure looks like a non functional foot uh, for him. Um, as long as he he's willing to uh, give up his foot and, and go with a, a baloney amputation, it's a it's a, a much simpler solution uh, to that portion of the of the problem. If he wanted to keep his um, tibia, uh, I would probably do a Boyd amputation, take his talus out, and fuse his calcaneus to the end of his tibia. Um, 
but then you're still left with trying to get the, the tibia healed. Uh, but those, are, I think those are the only two amputations yeah. that, you would, that you would really consider on him. His, his above knee amputation would be pretty high. Um, be pretty high transfemoral. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Well, I talked to this patient for a long time. Actually, this is my patient. Um, I met him over the course of actually about uh, two and a half years uh, because I, I, I met him multiple times for different debridements. So I got to know him uh, and his expectations. And his expectation was he wanted to, to be able to walk. He wanted to be able to work. Um, and he, um, he knows that he has some means, but not a lot. And so... Um, uh, when I talked about the difference between above and below knee amputation, um, the system in that country is very different. And above knee amputations with, with uh, four bar linkages or, or you know, microprocessor knees is just not available to them. So um, he wanted to try to get a, uh, a below the knee amputation. So then what do you do with the femur, guys? If you're going to do BKA, he wanted to go ahead with amputation. He knew his foot was no good. He called it his dog paw, actually, like a dog, the foot of a dog. He called it his dog paw. Why are we, why is this in, let me just ask you, why is I'm, why am I presenting it in the femur osteotomy um, <laughs> module? You have to osteotomize the femur, maybe. Well, we talked about um, other forms of tra bone transport. And I mean, you could you could do uh, you know you could do a mascule around the nail. You could do a bone transport yeah. around a, a bone transport right. with a rail around the nail. Yeah. Um, you know, anything that would aggressively eradicate the infection as at stage one, I think, would be good. And He's at stage four now of his eradication at multiple. Yeah. So anything to eradicate his infection. Um, so bone, you, would you be in favor of transport, you think, or would you mask lay in this kind of environment? I, I personally uh, don't like tra transport or external devices in the thigh. Yeah. Um, I, I like the idea of a mask lay around a nail. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I haven't had experience with a masculate for a large diaphyseal defect. It's mostly been for post-traumatic distal metaphyseal defects, which have been working quite reliably. Yeah. Well, that's kind of, um, it's kind of where we went with him. Um, I call this a peak and shriek. I got that from my partner, Finkmeyer. Um, you go in and peak and if it's infected, you know, that's the shriek, but if it's not infected, you proceed. So um, opening up his thigh, he does not have infection. So, um, and he has a 12 centimeter defect in his thigh, uh, but we went ahead with the below the knee amputation, but then we used his intact tibia, the remainder of his tibia for, um, for the masculine, if you will. And that's a reverse reamer. So it gives you the true dome osteotomy of the tibia, and then you've got an intercalary tibia as your mascule. Because he's now, he's had three antibiotic coated nails, uh, and then we took his calcaneus, his, you know, all the soft metaphyseal bone and morselized all that. And then he gets acetabular reamers for each side of his femur, and then he gets a single stage mascule. I've had experience with large mascule defects, primarily in this location, like in, in Central America, um, with they work, but you have to get back to them. You know, you have to do two and three bone grafts on them to get them to fully consolidate. Uh, and you can get 10, 12 centimeters with, but you just, there's just, you run out of harvest. You run out of places to take bone. In his case, we just happen to have a large source of bone. So he has this ended, you know, they're rounded. And then when you put them in, they fit perfectly because they're true domes. So they, they match. Um, and then uh, he, he wanted to show off. He asked uh, the surgeon to, uh, that was there to show him how he's moving his knee. He doesn't have a lot. He's, you know, at this point, he's still pretty stiff. Um, but here's how he looks. And, and I, the first thing you're going to probably draw your eyes to is the amount of varus in his, 
his knee in his in his distal femur, and we can talk about that. But uh, but what I'd rather draw your attention to is that with Mascale, um, if it's a, a you know a large bulk graft, but it's autograft. We're not talking allograft here because that's that's a very different dangerous sort of precedence to precedent to try in an in infection. But with autograft, I think um, this it's a viable option. So um, but yeah, looking at this, you know, in a long operation in a long day, and you're you don't have blood, allergenic blood, and you don't have an ICU, you, you can't spend a lot of time trying to spend extra time putting in blocking screws. And it just sort of, it, it makes you compromise a little bit of, of what you are trying to do, even though you're trying to do a perfect job, you don't always make perfect. But um, he sent us this video of him walking. So he now has a below the knee prosthesis. This is nine months post-op and he's back to work. So um, he's over a year and a half now. He's almost two years, so he can work. But um, the point of me showing this case was really that there is this other technique for osteotomy that Sirkin had asked us about before with a dome. And can you, is there a, a true dome osteotomy? It's not very commonly done. This is a great article if you can get the Journal of American Orthopedic Association, JAOS, last year had. They used it primarily in allografts for tumors, but, uh, but they also uh, showed uh, acute treatment of non-union. This is an infected non-union treated with a dome osteotomy with a reverse reamer. Uh, and you can compress, you can, you can uh, correct rotation. So um, it just requires a huge footprint because these reamers are really big. So you can't just put this in a small, it's gotta be for something large where you've already got it open. And I, I just wanted to show you what this looks like um, if you actually were to prepare it there just opposing, you can correct rotation and angulation with it. So, so on this case, the take homes are that uh, we really like to do bone transport, but in this sort of environment, you have to start thinking of other things besides transport. And mascale is a very viable option. You can use for large defects, but you have to be willing to do multiple surgeries on them. I love it. I think it's great. That is very but cool. Very cool. I always so, consider, um, I always consider, you know, uh, spare parts. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, sometimes we lose sight of that. Um, you know, another common time when when that uh, is helpful is uh, some of these lawnmower injuries uh, where uh, there will be a portion that you can't save, but you can utilize to build something else. Um, uh, love, love that uh, yeah. technique. Nice job. So, um, Mauricio, any comments? No, it's a great case. It's a great solution for this patient. I'm sure that he's much happier now. Yeah, it's a great. It's life changing. Yeah. Um, I think we should it's probably. Can, can oh, go I ahead. Just, uh, um, the. Uh, the final x-ray there almost looks like it's mostly the, uh, the mascule membrane that is ossified uh, as yeah. opposed to, you know, I, I don't know uh, how much bone graft you added around that. I, I assume quite a bit, but um, it, it has a, the look of the, the membrane that's ossified, which is not uncommon. Right, and that's what we see in those huge uh, mascalades is you really only start to get it right on the periphery exactly as you said along the membrane. And then it, it takes a long time. It's gonna be one to two years of, of maturation. Um, and right, I don't think the, I don't think that, uh, the autograft, the structural autograft is, is really incorporated like you're saying. It's all, I, I basically grafted at the two proximal and distal ends. You can see where most of the graft yeah. was here and here. And some of it probably fell posteriorly. So you can't you can't with those reamers just put the the structural autograft end on end without additional more morselized bone. You you added bone. Oh, graft. you can you can put them end on end, but I thought I should try to stimulate this membrane and um, yeah, they fit they fit really well. It's compressible and everything, but um, so there it wasn't to fill gaps. It was just really to fill the space that's left over from the spacer, and try to get more bone growing. 
Just think of it just like beads versus a, a spacer, right? Beads have a more surface area. So I think you have more exposure to cells uh, when you have more slides graphed than with a bulk, both bulk autographed. Um, I want to just uh, give a plug for this Saturday. Um, a couple of the participants today, three of the participants today, I have to thank all three of you, Mauricio uh, and Tim, actually, and then also Mitch. All of you, thank you so much for participating today. But two of you, Tim and Mauricio, will be here on Saturday uh, with Jim Standard and Michael Miranda to, to start the journey on, around the knee. We're going to have... Uh, two sets of discussions, one on the distal femur, one on the, uh, the proximal tibia for intraarticular, uh, periarticular um, malunions and corrections. So uh, you'll have those guys uh, next week. Um, today's recording will be available in uh, 24 hours sent to those who registered through Zoom. And then a little bit after that on YouTube, if you go to the AO Trauma North America channel and look for the playlist right here that says osteotomy course, you'll be able to find our discussion today. And so some of that stuff that we went through kind of fast, you can just replay it. So with that, um, guys, thank you so much for participating in this panel. Thank you.